Blog Entry, September 8th, 2014. Henry Gaffigan is dead. Cisneros and I hadn't been sent to get him since that night he spoke, and I was thankful for that. Until yesterday. We were supposed to take him from Sunshine Convalescent to San Gabriel Kidney Center. As soon as his name appeared on our pager, my blood turned to ice. And I'm pretty sure I was physically shaking as we walked through the door. But we didn't even get to his room before one of the snotty, normally inattentive nurses caught us. Mr. Gaffigan passed last night for no apparent reason. His blood pressure dropped and his family had a DNR order in place. Normally, I wouldn't have found this revelation particularly shocking. He was old and sick, and Sunshine has a reputation for handing out the wrong meds. But Cisneros had to use the restroom, leaving me outside what had been Henry Gaffigan's room. Not thinking, I looked through the little window in the door, directly at the wall, beside what had been Henry Gaffigan's bed. There were little pictures on the wall, done in black ink. I think it was his roommate, the nurse told me. Mr. Gaffigan definitely didn't have the motor skills for art. But I wasn't so sure. Because I'd seen that arrangement of straight lines and triangles before, long ago, on a chalk chocolate bar. What the fuck, guys? What is going on? Blog entry, September 15th, 2014. Woke up at noon today. My mom said she called my boss and told him I was sick. I looked like I needed to sleep. She probably had a point. I haven't been sleeping well the last week or so. Not since Henry Gaffigan spoke to me. And especially not since he died. I keep on having this same dream over and over again. I'm running through a maze and whenever I think I've found the way out, I hit a wall and I have to start over again. Except the walls aren't really walls. They're invisible and I can't touch them. But somehow I know when I can't go any farther. The only thing I can see is a dry golden field extending infinitely in all directions. Above my head, the sky is sunny and cloudless. I think it's warm there. So, I run around, following these invisible passageways, and I'm nervous because I know someone is following me. I can't see them, but I hear whispering, high-pitched, sing-songy, those recorders I used to play in the third grade music class. I can't quite make out what's being whispered. It might not even be English or Spanish or any other language I've heard. And sometimes that pipish whispering is accompanied by a rustling in the grass and the footsteps of a cat. I whirl around but the whispering and footsteps automatically cease staring at dead air. Last night, I felt something reach for me, jostling my hair. It couldn't have been the wind, because the grass in front of me didn't move. Filled with an indescribable sense of dread, I ran faster. The footsteps behind me grew louder, loud enough for me to notice their three-beat waltz-like rhythm, and the whispering became a hum, then a melody finally an entire wind section, the urgent cascading notes echoing off the invisible walls around me, and something clasped my shoulder, something spindly, gray, scaly, tough, and covered with coarse black hairs. But when I whirled around to face the owner of the horrific appendage, I saw nothing but dirty white and gray bumps. 
the stucco ceiling, streaked by the light of the midday sun. Blog entry, September 22nd, 2014. I think I'm going crazy. That must be it. I haven't had nightmares since I was a little kid. All of a sudden, I'm waking up dizzy and nauseous from an impossibly lucid dream. Right after I wrote my last blog entry, I drove to CVS and picked up a box of sleeping pills. When I was in kindergarten and woke up screaming, crying, and puking four times a week, my mom told me she'd solve the problem by giving me a spoonful of cough syrup before bed. Apparently, she'd gone about things the right way. One pill made me sleep like a baby. Until last night. I had the box in my nightstand, but I wanted to stay up for a bit to finish section 3 of the UC Irving online application. Next thing I knew, it was morning. I'd woken up and showered and was walking from my car to the station. I mean... I assumed I'd woken up and showered and drove to work, because there I was, on the sidewalk and in my uniform. I opened the door and walked past the dispatch booth to grab my time card, when the dispatcher, a chick named Mary, gasped. Gomez? she cried. What are you... how did you... what's wrong? I started eight. Did Langdon change the schedule again without telling me? But, but you don't work here. The police said, why are you out of jail? Jail? Mary's always been a little ditzy, but her shock and confusion were sincere. Are you smoking something? I was here yesterday. But apparently, Mary wasn't trying to be funny. In one fluid movement, she shut and locked the door to the dispatch booth. Through the thin walls, I could hear her dialing a number on her phone. Thoroughly mystified, I checked the printed copy of the schedule that Langdon, my supervisor, always tapes up on the wall. 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock, Unit 51, Cisneros, Green. Heartbeat quickening, I scanned the numbers and names. The date was correct. September 17th, 2014. There were some definite differences between this schedule and the one I glanced over yesterday. I didn't recognize some of the names. Jariel? O'Rourke? Lang? And a few names were missing, including mine. Gomez? turned around. Cisneros was standing behind me, except he looked different. He was sporting a neat goatee and mustache, his longish black hair pulled back in a knobby ponytail. Yesterday he was clean shaven with a buzz cut. Gomez, I, what the fuck? He, like Mary, was looking at me as though I'd sprouted another head. What's going on? Why am I not on the schedule? Uh, Ari, I miss you and all, but I don't think Langdon's going to give you your job back. How are you even here? I mean, the newspaper said you were going away for eight years. A eight years? What newspaper? What the fuck is going on? Sister Rose took a step back. The front door opened, and I heard heavy footsteps. Charlie Green, all six foot four of him, stepped out of the hallway. There was a scream from the dispatch booth, and Mary came charging out wide-eyed and hysterical. Grab her! Lock her in the office! Before I knew what was happening, she was clasping my wrists behind my back. Sister Rose froze. Green barreled towards me, shoving Sister Rose out of the way, and then I was looking at the world upside down and backwards as he picked me up, swung me over his shoulder, and dropped me unceremoniously on the floor of Langdon's office. He slammed the door, and I heard the lock click. 
I stood up and lunged for the phone on Langdon's desk, desperate to contact my parents or Jose or my best friend or anyone who could explain the discrepancy between the world I'd fallen asleep in and the one I'd woken up to. Then I saw a newspaper headline popping out from under a pile of billing printouts. It was an article cut out of the Los Angeles Times, dated, dated August 20th. Former EMT is sentenced to eight years for drunk driving death. Yesterday, the article stated, Ariana Gomez, 22, of Duarte, was sentenced to eight years in prison after pleading guilty to vehicular manslaughter. to describe her crime. On January 5th, 2014, at 12.45am, she made a right turn through a red light at the intersection of Foothill and Rosemead in Pasadena, on the way to the freeway heading home after attending a house party. She'd struck a bicyclist, Adam Yen, 20, of Arcadia, killing him instantly. Her blood alcohol level was 0.14, nearly twice the legal limit. I read the article twice, and then I lost my restraint, and then I screamed and screamed until my throat burned and my knees buckled, and I fell back onto Langdon's chair and missed. I fell down, the world spun, then blackness, then the sound of the door opening and Green's voice. Where the fuck did she go? And then I was staring up at stucco peaks and valleys, eyes burning. My bedside lamp was on, and my laptop was open on my pillow. I rolled over to check the time. 6.18. Twelve minutes until my alarm went off. My right arm ached and my head throbbed. I turned to the side and puked all over the floor. I swung my legs over the side of my bed and tried to stand. But as soon as I shifted my balance, the room began to spin, and then I was staring at the stucco again, drenched in cool sweat, too weak to move. I don't know what's going on. That was the weirdest dream I've ever had in my life. I mean, it didn't even feel like a dream. I was at the station. I was talking to my partner. I could feel Mary's hands on me, and the lucidity of it all wasn't even the strangest part. I had been at a party in Pasadena on January 4th, my friend Caitlin's birthday, and I had thrown back a few PBRs, but I could talk straight and walk a line, thought I was okay to drive home around midnight. But I hadn't driven home. I'd had second thoughts. I'd taken off my shoes and fallen asleep on Caitlin's couch and woke up nine hours later with a drool running down my chin and Jen, Jenny Wong's ex-boyfriend passed out on my shoulder. I lay there on my back on the rug for the better part of an hour before I had the strength to drag myself to, into bed. I had to call out of work again and I'm pretty sure I copped as much of an attitude as I could manage with Mary, who answered the phone. Hours later, in the shower, I noticed a dark purple bruise on my right shoulder that wasn't there yesterday. Exactly the sort of bruise I'd have expected if Charlie Green had dropped me on the floor. Like he did in my dream.